Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Uh, Y'all, it has been a crazy week of unexpected travel, which is very different for me because normally I have a bunch of crazy weeks of expected travel. But uh, this week we had a bit of a family emergency. And so this week I ended up going from all of my North Carolina time to Miles time Then one day at home before taking a road trip to go and be there for the family emergency situation-y type thing. Then on top of that, and don't worry, everyone and everything is fine. But yeah, on top of that, my car blew a tire on the way to said emergency. So the travel took a whole day longer than expected. But uh, it's all good. And while I wasn't able to dive in as much as I had hoped in my new volunteer position at Aquarium of Niagara, I was actually able to start, which was wonderful. I had a great first day. And uh, on the Friday this episode drops, I'll be chilling there again doing the thing. It's a really cool opportunity, and I'm really grateful to be part of a team um, at a at an AZA facility after talking about all of this stuff for so many years. So yeah, I'm hoping this week will calm down a bit, but eh, who knows? Um, but I'm telling you all of this in part to update you on my life, uh, because that's what I do, but also because I ended up recording this episode kind of early this week as time allowed. So if you sent me something and didn't hear your name or, or didn't hear the story and you thought it might be a bigger one, uh, listen, listen again next week. I, I may have just not gotten to it before I recorded this week. And yes, if you happen to be new here and uh, aren't sure what I'm talking about, you can submit things to me and. And uh, I may include them in Zoo News. And whether I do or not, I'll thank you at the end of the episode. You can tag me in them at Ross Safari on the socials and make sure you're following along uh, or email them to me at Ross at gmail.com. Um, I'm also at Ross Safari Pod on the TikTok machine. And uh, you can you can DM me and just just all the things. So, yeah, it's great to have you all here. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so I've gotten in the habit of dropping my first story right at the top of this section before going to births and deaths recently. It was supposed to be a one-time thing, but this is the third week in a row that I have a big topic I want to hit, so I guess I'm going to stick with that for now. I guess we'll find out as as we go on. Uh, But this week, that topic is Flacco, the Eurasian Eagle Owl. Now, I have lots of thoughts, as I am sure you're not surprised to hear. So, first of all, in case anyone isn't aware of the story, a little over a year ago, Flacco the Owl escaped from the Central Park Zoo in New York City after the fencing of his habitat was vandalized. He escaped through a hole that was cut into the fence, which apparently took some time and effort, and uh, then Flacco was seen hanging out in Central Park. Keepers tried to entice him back home, but the supply of rats and other prey items in the park, and there are so many rats and other gross little things, y'all, made it so that even high-value food rewards weren't of interest to him. And I actually have some thoughts on another reason he might not have returned, which I'll get to in a moment here. So after a few weeks of trying to get him back, and after regularly observing Flacco eating and doing other appropriate owl behaviors, the team at the zoo decided there really wasn't anything else they could do. So Flacco got to stay in the wild. Of course, the anti-zoo crowd took this as a huge win. 
And actually, a lot of media ran with the story as a win for Flacco, even many organizations that don't normally have anti-zoo biases. It was a feel-good story about an animal that got out of a zoo and was able to survive and even thrive and become a bit of an iconic celebrity in New York City, right? Well, not, not quite. So at the start of February, the media started sharing the story again, as it was the one-year anniversary of Flacco's flight to freedom. He had made it a whole year, and the anti-zoo crowd got just very excited about the press. After all, this was proof that animals could make it in the wild even after living in zoos, right? About a week later, though, Flacco was again in the news. And this time, it was because reports were coming out that he had become a, well, the term that was used was a peeping Tom. He was regularly seen sitting outside the windows of businesses and even residences, just watching the people. Intently watching, according to many. Uh, Some behavior experts said it seemed like he was missing the human connection he grew up with. The anti-zoo crowd scoffed, of course. And then, on February 23rd, Flacco was found dead on the ground, the victim of a window strike with a large building. The WCS, the organization that runs the New York City zoos, has claimed the body and has performed a full necropsy at the Bronx Zoo because there is reason to believe that Flacco didn't just randomly run into a window, though that kills birds and cities around the world every day. As a quick side note and reminder, I just recently reported about a time where 1,000 birds died in one night in Chicago by running into just one building. Just one building took down 1,000 birds in one night. It's, it's a real problem, y'all. And, and trust me, those weren't the only bird strikes in Chicago that night. But anyway, getting back to Flacco, uh, the team at the WCS believes that Flacco was sick before his death, in part because his fans in the Upper West Side had reported they had not heard his hooting for a few nights preceding his death. So, in the end, Flacco made it roughly 13 months from the day he left the Central Park Zoo to the day his life ended prematurely. He was just a month shy of his 14th birthday at the time of his passing. Now, for comparison, Eurasian eagle owls have a life expectancy of 20 years in the wild and can easily live up to 60 years in human care. By setting Flacco free, and I am using that word with the largest air quotes that my fingers can make, the vandal or vandals that committed this crime robbed Flacco of up to 46 years of life. And of course, the anti-zoo crowd is saying that it's better to have one year of freedom than 46 in prison. In captivity, the word I have stopped using here because the connotations that it has simply don't really apply to what life in a zoo is like for most animals, especially if it's a, a good zoo, an accredited facility. The, the fact that Flacco made it a, a full year in the wild is frankly, a miracle. Birds that are raised in human care are simply not equipped for life in the wild. Heck, birds born in the wild aren't really equipped for life in the modern wild as it is experienced by birds that live around humans, and especially in cities. That's why the life expectancy of Eurasian eagle owls is two to three times as long for birds in human care than it is in the wild. By all indications, Flacco didn't have an amazing year of a free life. It sounds like he got lonely, missed human companionship, didn't learn how to navigate the city particularly well, possibly got sick, and died for it. Also, those hoots that fell silent near the end of his life? Flacco's fans said they fell in love listening to them, finding comfort and joy in them night after night. And... While humans loved these sounds, many bird experts say he was probably hooting looking for a mate, one that he would never, ever find in New York City. For all the comfort these sounds brought to New Yorkers, they were very likely the sound of an animal that couldn't find the comfort and joy it was seeking night after night. And going along with that, 
If he did end up sick before his passing, as is believed, uh, there are a bunch of possible things that may have caused it. For instance, it's very possible that he ingested uh, some form of rat poison from the rats that he ate, or he got lead poisoning from the environment there, or, or even the uh, avian influenza that has been traveling around the country and the world these last few years. Of course, the anti-zoo crowd, and yes, you'll notice that uh, I'm using that term pretty exclusively now because the term animal rights activists just sounds like way more positive than I think these groups deserve to seem, but I digress. Uh, the anti-zoo crowd is saying that just the fact that Flacco didn't return to his keepers is proof that he didn't want to be at the zoo, and that whatever the results of this failed freedom experiment are, the fact that he didn't return is proof that he didn't want to be in the zoo and preferred being free, even with the associated risks. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the Lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. But, and this is something I haven't seen in, honestly, any of the media I've looked at about this, and I've looked at a lot. Um, I have a different thought about why Flacco didn't return home. Birds tend to spook very easily. Very, very easily. They take flight or fight to a very literal place since they can literally fly away from any threat. You may remember Danny Poirier Larson sharing the story of Kinta, the kookaburra she raised and trained from the day Kinta hatched and still works with today. Well, one day, uh, Danny wore a headband to work and it freaked Kinta out. She literally was unable to accept Danny in a headband, despite the fact that Danny was the consistent thing in her life from day one. I have also had the opportunity to meet many birds who freak out at the drop of a hat, both literally and figuratively, and uh, I've witnessed literally some of the best avian trainers in the world experience fly-offs because a bird was spooked by a car horn or the wind, or something that none of us who were watching were able to figure out what it was. So thinking about all of that, let's remember that Flacco had been living at the Central Park Zoo for the vast majority of his 12 years of life, when suddenly some random human shredded the enclosure that he called home. Who knows what happened in that moment? A human merely being near an area of the enclosure could have been scary enough for Flacco to panic and not feel safe. Did the person try to touch Flacco to, to coax him out of his exhibit? What was the sound like for Flacco? What did he experience? What was the experience of having his safe space invaded like for him? It very well could have been terrifying. Like, how long was this scary new person doing a scary new thing to Flacco's safe space? It is very possible, and I would argue even likely, that Flacco didn't refuse to return because he didn't want to be in his safe home where he spent over a decade getting great care and building relationships with his keepers, but because he no longer saw the zoo as a safe space after the vandal violated that safety for him. With many birds, a traumatic experience like that is simply not one you're coming back from. Now, I want to be clear and say that I am hypothesizing here, because in truth, there is no way to know what the bird was thinking or experiencing. I mean, heck, it's even possible that he just saw all the rats in the park and thought, woo, no more controlled diet for me. 
but I think my theory makes a lot of sense based on the bird behavior I have learned and the ridiculous stories I have been told time and time again about birds freaking out about the smallest change in their environment. A lot of trainers say that every new experience becomes an antecedent to any future training. And this was a heck of an antecedent to have to overcome for Flacco as far as, you know, trying to go back to other training, like getting back on a keeper's glove or whatever. It's, it's just, it's a real problem. So I would argue that it's very possible, even likely, that Flacco is actually proof that the best thing for zoo animals is to stay in zoos and not be traumatized by the people who are misguidedly trying to make their lives better while actually cutting them short. And that Flacco already represented this idea before his untimely death just based on his behavior in New York City. Now, so far... In saying all of this, I have presented the idea that it was an anti-zoo activist who committed this crime. And the truth is, I don't know that it was. It could have been a kid being dumb, someone doing a dare, etc. There are a bunch of possibilities, and the NYPD has no leads. But the fact that the anti-zoo crowd applauded this act of vandalism says it all. Whether it was one of their group that did this or not, they cheered it on and as such are complicit in his sadness and in his death. And look, here's the thing. It would be easy to claim that I am biased as a person who loves zoos, and I mean, obviously, I host this dang podcast. And of course, I freely admit there is some of that bias here. Of course there is. But I have worked hard to look at this issue from a scientific perspective. I have also seen firsthand the incredible care provided to animals at the good zoos and aquariums around the country. I am confident that I am on the right side of this discussion. I'm not a zoo fan because I host this podcast. I host this podcast because zoos convinced me that they are amazing places with amazing people. Flacco simply isn't the new symbol for animals being free from zoos. He wasn't that before his death, and he certainly doesn't remain that after barely making it one year in the wild. Instead, Flacco is the new Keiko, the killer whale who activists worked to get set free after he starred in Free Willy, and who went on to have a short and traumatic experience in the wild before dying way too young. But the scary thing is, people on the other side of this argument lie to themselves about what happened to Keiko and are already starting to lie to themselves about Flacco. They are making a tragedy into a positive, uplifting, heroic tale, all in the name of advancing their agenda. And this is the new norm, it seems, where everyone is so entrenched in their views that they would rather distort reality than even just admit that life is far more complex than the often black and white coloration we like to give it. When we pull all the feel-good vibes away from this story and look at it factually, the most likely scenario becomes Flacco was traumatized by someone trying to give him the, quote, gift of freedom. Confused and alone and scared, he took to Central Park where he found enough rats to live on and avoided the keepers he had built a relationship with because of the trauma he experienced during his last moments in the zoo. In just over a year of time in the wild, he hooted nightly looking for a mate that would never come, spent time staring into windows trying to reconnect with humans after losing the relationships he had at the zoo, ate rats or encountered lead or something that possibly poisoned him, and ended up flying into a window, stealing anywhere from 6 to 46 years of life from him. There's no joy here. Flacco will be missed by the community that loved him, and by the zoo and the keepers that have had to deal with losing him tragically twice now. There is no hero here. There is no joy. It's a sad story from the moment the vandal struck the enclosure until the moment Flacco struck that building. However, I do have one positive that may come from this. New York State Senator Brad Holyman Sigel has announced a push to get two pieces of legislation signed into law. 
the Dark Skies Protection Act, and the Bird Safe Buildings Act, which has since been renamed the Flacco Act. These acts would combine to reduce light pollution and ensure that new buildings would use bird-friendly glass, two things that would greatly help wild birds avoid the fate that befell Flacco. If these laws do manage to pass, then at least this sad story will have a beautiful epilogue. Rest in peace, Flacco. I'm sorry someone put you through everything you went through. And I'm sorry so many people are acting like it was a positive and even attacking the keepers you had strong relationships with because of their own agenda. You will be missed, but you needn't be, if not for the stupidity of some human. Anyway, moving on, let's get to our births. Yeah, I just I just have to say this. I'm I'm sitting here cracking up because I just did a 15 minute rant about uh, what happened with Flacco. And uh, then I'm just like, hey, let's talk about births. And that might be the worst transition ever. So I apologize. But hopefully, you know that I'm laughing with you as you heard me say that. But no, seriously, now that we've had this great transition, let's talk about births. Our good friends at Adventure Aquarium have announced the birth of three new little blue penguins into the colony at the zoo. So, okay, if you're a baby and you're a little blue penguin, normally I would say you're a little blue penglet because I like doing that on this podcast, but but maybe in this case it makes you just a littler blue penguin? Bah, I'm sticking with little blue penglet. Anyway, along with announcing the chicks, the aquarium has announced their names, two of which I think are adorable, and one of which I think is weird. Their names are Bananas Foster, Kiwi, and Name Tibida. What a weird name. Name Tibida? Tibida doesn't even have a vowel in it. Oh, wait, it's it's named TBD. They're they're going to be announcing it or or maybe figuring that out. I'm I'm an idiot. Sorry. Anyway, the Los Angeles Zoo has announced the birth of a colobus monkey. The little monklet is doing well being raised by mom and can be seen on exhibit with her and the rest of the colobus troop, including a slightly older baby. And the Fort Worth Zoo has also announced the birth of a new colobus monkey, also in a troop that had another recent birth. This little one is named Baloo and is showing some adventurous tendencies. So now you can go to L.A. or Fort Worth and and visit and the zoos and see two baby colobus monkeys. That's that's incredible. Like at each one. That's incredible. The Living Desert has announced the birth of two meerkats or meerlets. They were born to Mom Vinny and Dad Frenzy, I love those names so much, and are doing very well. Congrats to the team. The Indianapolis Zoo has announced the birth of a baby white rhino, the first one ever born at the zoo. The calf has demonstrated a knack for getting zoomies, something I love seeing rhinos do. Y'all, if you haven't seen a rhino with zoomies, you simply have not spent enough time at rhino habitats. Do it. It's amazing. Uh, Herd introductions uh, at the Indianapolis Zoo won't happen until the spring, but mom and rhinelet are doing well. And then Brookfield Zoo has announced the birth of a gray seal pup to Mother Georgie. This is Georgie's first time giving birth, and as she was a stranded animal that was deemed non-releasable before finding her forever home at the Brookfield Zoo, her genetics are really important in the population. The pup's father, Kenak, was also found stranded in the wild, so while he has sired young before, this pup brings some really important genetics into the zoo-based seal population and is just very exciting. And then we will flip the coin and just hit on a couple of deaths this week. Uh, First of all, in case you missed my bonus episode this week, I wanted to mention here that Lynn, the 10-year-old red panda at the Cincinnati Zoo, passed away this week. I had lots of thoughts and audio to share about this incredible girl, so if you missed that episode, go check it out. Um, I I think it's a real nice tribute to, to just an incredible panda. The Kansas City Zoo has announced the passing of Tamale a female California sea lion who passed away at the age of 11. Tamale had been suffering from leptospirosis, a bacterial infection that is the most common disease in wild sea lions and which has a two-thirds mortality rate even amongst sea lions receiving treatment. Uh, 
The zoo did all they could, and it's really sad to see this happen, sending all our love to the team at the Kansas City Zoo. And then, last but not least, in deaths this week, the Honolulu Zoo has announced the humane euthanasia of one of the oldest zebras in human care, 32-year-old Mr. Z. Mr. Z loved carrots, salt blocks, basking in the sun, and hanging out with giraffes. So I actually think that uh, I have a little Mr. Z in me. He will be greatly missed and uh, sending all my love to the team at the Honolulu Zoo. Moving on to the rest of the Zoo News segment this week, I wanted to circle back to the story I did recently on online scams that pertain to zoos. Many zoos and aquariums have reported that scammers have set up false websites and fake social media profiles offering discounted tickets, which people are surprised to find out are bogus when they show up to the facility. Well, as this scam has grown in scope, not only are more zoos and aquariums being targeted, but the scammers are coming up with unique hooks to get people to believe the scam. For instance, the Maryland Zoo scam page says the discount exists because the zoo is currently celebrating their 150th anniversary. Never mind that the zoo already did that a a while ago, but it does make the offer look more appealing. The Kansas City Zoo's fake page is also claiming it's for an anniversary, this one the 115th, which is actually how old the zoo is, so good job on being accurate, but bad job for scamming people, scammers. Uh, But yeah, just a friendly reminder to keep your eyes out for false ads like this and to report the pages if you see them. It really makes a difference. Uh, Only buy zoo tickets from the actual zoo's website or going to the zoo. Uh, And this is true kind of regardless of what zoo you're going to right now. This is a very targeted attack on many zoological facilities. Only buy tickets from the zoo itself. And remember that a deal that looks too good to be true probably is. The Santa Barbara Zoo is working hard to help save the island fox, a species of adorable fox with a very small range in California. Shockingly, it lives mostly on, you guessed it, islands. When a female pup was discovered on San Nicolas Island with an open fracture of the metatarsal bones of her hind leg, the zoo stepped in and transported her to the mainland, where the zoo teamed up with friends of the island fox to pay for the surgery necessary to repair the broken leg. Since the surgery, the fox has been doing well recovering at the Santa Barbara Zoo, but is not a candidate for release back into the wild. As such, she will be moving to another AZA-accredited facility in the near future to serve as an ambassador for her species. What an awesome story of multiple organizations working together to save one very small, very adorable fox. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. The Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. has announced that one of their cheetahs will be looking very different the next time you visit the zoo. Lita, an 11-year-old female cheetah, recently underwent a veterinary procedure to remove a cataract which was causing her to have decreased vision and one of her eyes to appear cloudy. During the surgery, vets discovered Lita had glaucoma and a ruptured lens, which is known to cause tumor growth in domestic cats. The animal care team made the decision to remove Lita's eye so that she would not develop similar issues or suffer from additional health issues related to a possible tumor down the road. Lita is doing well post-surgery, exploring her habitat as normal and eating well, and now when you visit the zoo, you can see a one-eyed cheetah living and thriving because of the incredible work done by the vets who went into that surgery expecting a routine cataract operation and instead used their skills and knowledge to improve Lita's future quality of life significantly. 
And actually, I have another cool story out of the National Zoo here in the U.S. The team there was looking at the bacteria living in the reproductive tract of black-footed ferrets. And to clarify, this is the healthy, normal bacteria that lives there because we all have weird little microorganisms living everywhere, including our naughty bits. Hope, hope you're not listening over lunch, friends. Uh, anyway, they compared in situ and ex situ populations and compared the reproductive microbiome to markers of fertility, such as the amount of viable offspring produced by females and the sperm count of males. The study found significant differences between the microbiomes of reproductively successful and unsuccessful ferrets. The hope is that this information may help us identify and address problems that contribute to poor reproduction in species like black-footed ferrets that tend to struggle to reproduce at a sustainable rate in the wild. Very cool, very interesting and weird study. I love it. The Brookfield Zoo in Chicago has announced a new species that will be visiting the zoo for a while. Koalas! Two male koalas named Brumby and Willem will be living at the zoo in an indoor habitat that also has an outdoor area, so they will be visible a lot. My assumption is that uh, these guys will be on loan from the San Diego Zoo. I'm not sure of that fact, but I know that San Diego has done it that way before at other facilities. Regardless of where they're coming from, it will be great to have this incredible species available to see at the Brookfield Zoo this summer. And last but not least in our Zoo News segment, Taylor Swift was on tour in Australia this past week, and she spent two days visiting the Sydney Zoo. On the second day, her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, joined her. On stage in Sydney, she said, and I quote, talking about the zoo here, we've been 100% on our days off. I'm really all about the red panda. Y'all, that made me so happy. I think you guys don't understand how cool kangaroos are because you have so many. They are so cool, so strong, so bouncy. I could not love this more. If Taylor Swift can influence her fans to get excited about zoos and about red pandas and about kangaroos, then that's that's amazing. It's such good news. And and I really hope that people run with this and that, um, you know, panda keepers look at this and and start to tell the the kids that are looking at pandas and and wanting to learn about them. Hey, this is this is the animal that Taylor Swift says she's all about, y'all. Anyway, that brings us to Stereotypical Animal Podcast Theme Song Here to bring you to Conservation News All right, so uh, we'll start off with a couple rough ones. Um, The avian influenza that has been traveling around the globe has reached mainland Antarctica for the first time. This could be the start of an ecological disaster for the penguins that call Antarctica home, as they tend to gather in tightly packed colonies that consist of hundreds of thousands of birds. We'll have to see what the results end up being in this case, uh, but it's, it's a very scary announcement, and we really don't know what's coming next. Um, also, uh, well, poop. I've been coming into this section with good news about rhino conservation a lot lately, but now it's time to remind you all that rhinos still need our help. The South African Department of Forestry, Fisheries, and the Environment announced that 499 rhinos died by illegal poaching in the country last year. This is an increase of over 10% over the previous year, which represents a startling step backwards uh, when rhino numbers have been very good across Africa overall. Some protected parks in South Africa saw an increase as high as 33% over the previous year, illustrating how poachers are getting smarter and targeting parks that are less secure than others. The belief from people on the ground is that the poaching increases are happening due to crime syndicates becoming more interested in profiting from rhinos, and as such, the issue is bigger than just something that can be handled by rangers. Instead, the government and the police need to crack down on the syndicates in order to help get rhino poaching back under control. Uh, 
Fortunately, with the numbers being good in many other areas of Africa, the government of South Africa will have a lot of blueprints to follow as they build their next steps uh, towards fixing this problem, and hopefully we will report uh, better numbers from South Africa next year. On a happier note, a species of bird has been rediscovered in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Earlier this year, the yellow-crested helmet shrike was seen and photographed for the first time in 20 years. That's incredible! And it goes back to the discussion we keep having on here, just pointing out how incredibly large the world is and how little of nature we actually get to see or know about in any detail. I am so glad this bird wasn't lost to us after all. And from potential losses to actual losses to a rediscovery, let's go to a new discovery because then these stories just keep getting better. A new species of anaconda has been discovered, and it is believed to be the biggest in the world. This story is a great example of the collaboration of native peoples and environmental scientists and conservationists because the team from the University of Queensland that made the discovery traveled to the Amazon in Ecuador after being invited by the Waroni people to observe the anacondas they believed were the biggest in existence. One of the anacondas discovered was 20.7 feet long, and some of the Warani people claimed they have measured snakes around 25 feet long. Researchers were excited to not only find such large snakes, but were ecstatic to realize they had discovered a new species. As a fun extra twist to this story, the discovery was documented by National Geographic cameras that were filming for the upcoming series Pole to Pole with Will Smith. I did not have Will Smith on my Conservation News bingo card this week, y'all, but there he is. I, I don't know how Chris Rock feels about it. Anyway... And then from one species to a whole bunch of species, you know that theme about how little we know about what is in our world, especially in the ocean? Well, researchers have been exploring underwater mountains off the coast of Chile recently, and so far have discovered over 100 new species of aquatic life. The species are all different types, including corals, lobsters, sea urchins, and more. But yeah, over 100. 100 species in one underwater mountain range that has yet to be explored until now? It's amazing and encouraging how much we still don't know about. In other news. A new study shows that Joro spiders, an invasive species that has been slowly traveling around the United States, are surprisingly tolerant to living in urban environments, which might enable them to move into cities and other urban areas across the east coast of the United States. These spiders can grow to be the size of an average human palm and are orb weavers, meaning they are known for creating circular webs that are highly symmetrical. Some experts believe that these spiders are poised to really expand their population in the next year or two, and the fact that they have qualities that make them well adapted to life in urban environments may mean we see a huge influx of the spiders, and more importantly, their complex webs, in the coming years on the east coast of the U.S., particularly in large cities. So, uh, have fun sleeping tonight, my arachnophobic listeners. And, uh, okay, so let's move on to something less freaky for those of you that are freaked out by those things. Scientists recently discovered a 46,000-year-old worm that had been frozen in the Siberian permafrost. This is a type of worm that is considered extinct with nothing quite like it on the planet right now. Of course, the scientists did what anyone in that position would do and decided to thaw and revive the worm because scientists have clearly not seen enough Jurassic Park-style movies. When they revived the animal, not only did it come back to life, but it started reproducing through parthenogenesis, uh, unless the worm happened to get some sneaky shark sex while frozen, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so now there is not only this one-of-a-kind worm, but clones of it squirming around in a lab as well. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Sometimes I don't even know what to think when I read stories like this. So, uh, yeah, really large, big, scary spiders coming to U.S. cities 
and worms that were dead having babies. Again, have fun sleeping tonight, listeners. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, y'all. It is March. March is the month of my birthday. It's my birthday month. Yay! It's also Dolphin Awareness Month, which is, like, significantly less exciting, but, you know, still pretty cool, I guess. Then, for the week, we have National Pig Day on Friday, March 1st. March 3rd is World Wildlife Day, and March 4th through the 8th is National Aardvark Week. And for those of you who are wondering, the real thing that really matters here is, of course, March 31st is my birthday. So we got to get through the whole month, but then we shall celebrate my... No one cares, John. No one cares. All right, so there you have it, folks. Another episode of Raw Safari Zoo News is in the books, and uh, I really had fun on my rant with Flacco. I'm enjoying doing these deeper dives, so please reach out. Let me know what you think. I'm having a lot of fun with those, but I I also like listening to myself talk, and it does mean hearing less stories about, like, new exhibits opening and stuff, so let me know what you think, but I'm having a lot of fun doing those when the opportunity presents. I would never, like, force one. Uh, but anyway, I would like to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. And I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed stories this week, including Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley Croninger, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Emily Rockbuck, the Angel of Death, Dr. Laura Shank. Except. I think Laura was feeling bad about being called the angel of death because she sent me so many births this week and only a few deaths. So maybe somebody's having a change of heart. Also, she's a doctor. So let's be honest, we probably shouldn't call her the angel of death. Also, she's just a great human. But anyway, yes, thank you to the angel of death. Nice try, Dr. Laura Shank. Karen Musklow, Sam Evans, Melissa Reed, Jay Meredith, who, by the way, If you don't follow Jay, uh, he's an amazing photographer, and he recently had the opportunity to go and take photos of the turtles at the Turtle Survival Alliance. They're incredible shots. They're amazing. He does amazing work, and um, make make sure you're following. I will uh, will post some of his photos to give you a link to follow. Crystal Chapman, Taylor Isaac Gray, Dr. Zoe Rossi, Jess Wells, Jacob Zinn, Ken Tryon, Ali Pisano, Marianne Rossi, Anne Yoshioka, Tiffany Fowle, Ali Malensky, Kay Malensky, the Malensky. And then last but not least this week, I need to give a huge shout out to Matt Patford. Matt lives in Australia. And uh, upon listening to my episode where I recently discussed just how amazing I find Australia and how I have always found Australia to be an amazing place, he just opened the archive Uh, after checking first to make sure I would be interested in this, which was actually really appreciated as well. um, He sent me a bunch of really cool uh, photos from Australia, from zoos and from other wildlife excursions that he's had, um, showing me the animals and sharing what the experiences were like. And um, honestly, just making me feel like I was there and I was I was experiencing a side of Australia that I haven't gotten to experience yet. And it really meant a lot. I I was very appreciative. And, um, you know, Matt has shared more than just that with me. But uh, I'm I'm really grateful to have, you know, I can't call Matt really a friend yet. We're getting there. We're getting to know each other. But just the, the fan who listened and heard this thing and was like, I can make this guy's life better. I can make him happy and did. And it was like a multi-day project as he found these photos and sent them. And just, you know, it it was never too much. It was always the right amount. And they came in kind of slowly over time. And I spent time looking at them and and shared them with Zoe. And it was was just a really cool experience. So, Matt, thank you so much for that. Uh, You you deserve this big shout out here because I really do appreciate you just so much. Just so much. Uh, Yeah. And so there you have it, folks. That's that's everybody who contributed this week. And uh, I guess all I have left to say 
is that the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Snyder Kiss Wine. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.